This is looking slightly less ramshackle, Mr. Tudor. Mm. I'm disappointed. You've you've spent some expense. So, so we're moving towards hashtag slightly less ramshackle. Yeah. <laughs> when you say spent some expense, I spent like five pounds on an arm. It's five pounds more than you'd spent before. <laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Polyhedron Collider Cast episode 8. Mm. We're back! <laughs> oh, we've, good lord, run, run, run away! We've had a break, we've refreshed, played some well, old you games. you two are. <laughs> oh yeah, we, we just two have been on a break. Steve and I have been on holiday. Oh, yeah. Some of us have been working. Pull the other one. <laughs> <laughs> some of us have been turning up to work. <laughs> <laughs> That's more like it. So I'm Steve from polyhedroncollider.com, and with me you can hear the voices of... John Cage <laughs> and Andy Lewis. We've been away, so we've been playing some games, and well, let's talk about it. In the wilds of Scotland. In the wilds of Scotland. I should probably say before we go on a little bit further, let's say a big thanks to the Brawling Brothers for giving a shout out to us. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, their podcast went out today, which is Wednesday. Yes. And they uh, we won't us- give a date because that'll just embarrass you on the editing time. <laughs> Yeah, it'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> which, you'll now, which you'll now cut out. Oh dear. Um, so yeah, big thanks. Very humble to be mentioned by those chaps. Totally. That's it's part- all about the churros. All about the churros. <laughs> yeah. It's nice to hear from people across the pond as well. It is. Yeah. We're reaching far and wide and that is nice to know. Yeah. Mm. We're not just a ramshackle little podcast in the middle of England. <laughs> well, I think no, we, we are. are. We're, <laughs> we're an internationally renowned sh- ramshackle. Mm. <laughs> That's good to know. So, let's kick off. One game I've been playing, well, I played yesterday, and it's probably the game of the moment, the most hyped game there is around at the moment, Scythe. Mm -hmm. Now, I know we mentioned it in the previous podcast, and Andy mentioned it in the UK Games Expo episode. Yeah, Yeah, Andy quite likes this. So, I know we're kind of going around and repeating, retreading old ground a little bit here. Refining ourselves. Refining, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that did happen, (laughs) I listened back editing, and I must admit, that even listening to you, this was your second attempt to try and explain how Scythe worked. <laughs> and I was still struggling. And after playing it, I can understand why. It's, there's a lot to it, isn't it's there? It's a difficult game mm. to explain. It is. So, third time lucky then. <laughs> third time yeah, lucky. Yeah. Yes, so, you are a series of factions, and each has a separate faction with a separate faction sheet, so your own special ability. You then take a factory card, which is randomised as well, so everyone has a separate factory. The aim of the game is to exploit basically you're trying to get one of i think is that i can't remember the exact thing i think it's 12 different objectives exploit resources or each exploit other Exploit resources Everything. each other the land territory um, you basically get these little stars which you put down on the board to say i've claimed that objective and the objective can be upgrade all your upgrade your factory entirely build all four of your buildings that's the little card you get isn't it yeah that i mentioned last time yeah Yeah. okay so the factory is this little card with slots in and you've got cubes on the top row and when you do an upgrade action you move a cube from the top row to the bottom row and what that does is it makes your every action has got two actions as it were so two things you can do top row uh, usually you have to spend a resource and get something back Mm -hmm. the bottom row is you have to spend like a proper resource as in like a mineral or wood or food and you'll get something major back so right. generally most turns you're only especially at the beginning of the game you're only doing the top row mm-hmm. and as the game progresses you'll build up the resources to the bottom row but when I say upgrades you, you move these cubes from the top to the bottom and what they do is they reveal things underneath so they basically make your top actions get you better rewards mm-hmm. and your bottom actions cost less resources that's the dual level board I was talking about last time so underneath the sort the, the cubes are the same pictures basically as what's on the top level. Yeah. Obviously they're hidden by the cubes, as Steve says. So. But what's interesting is these factories are all random. Right. So they've got the same bottom row, but the order of the top row and the resources you need for each action are different for every yes. player. So every player's in a slightly different <coughs> situation. But as I said, there's kind of things you're going to need to do is you, you get a star for winning a fight, you get a star for... Brought your buildings out, getting maximum power, but you've also got this popularity track. So the popularity track tells you how many victory points you're going to get for each star. Basically, the whole game is about balancing, because if you try and do everything you can't, you've got to concentrate on two or three things that your board combination is good at. Now, I only played one game, and I really want to try it again to try and develop those, but what you're generally doing is expanding out on this kind of hex board. So every single hex has got a different kind of resource you can mine from it. So you're moving your workers, which are effectively meeples, as it were, across the board to try and grab these resources mm-hmm. and then use them to build mechs, build buildings, 
build, upgrade. All of these things can get you one of these stars as a victory point. You also get victory points for how much territory you control at the end of the game and how many resources you have left at the end of the game. Okay, so that's the side of it I'd not seen because yeah, you only play the short game. you play the demo version at the yeah. expo. So you, you're constantly juggling all these things. And the first half of the game, we play a five-player game, which is the maximum players the base deck can do. There's supposed to be an expansion coming out, which will add two more players. We play a five-player game in about three hours, so it's a learning game as well. Mm -hmm. And what we've tended to find for the first two hours, we're all more or less playing our own game. Like expanding out... Upgrading our factories so that it's more efficient, expanding that a bit further, grabbing that resource, grabbing this resource. And all of a sudden, we all kind of realised, hang on, because the game ends when you get all your six of your stars out, so you've got completely six objectives. So this point where all of a sudden you go, oh bugger, I need to look what everyone else is doing. Oh, hang on, he's got a mech on my doorstep. Is he going to attack me? Oh, I don't know. He might do. I'm going to attack him first. <laughs> <laughs> or if he does that, he's going to end the game. There was a, there was definitely a point, especially in the last quarter of an hour, when you realised, hang on, I've only got two stars out, someone else has got three. Mm -hmm, what mm -hmm. do I do to try and maximise my points? So do you think that's just inexperience in the game? Like, Would would it always happen that you'd spend the first however long... Probably, because... Just building stuff up. The yeah. starter game we played was very different. Right. Uh, I mean, I say very different... Juliet, the demo from Morning Players, she was obviously very experienced because she'd been playing it for two days straight. Mm -hmm. So she knew the rules inside, or most of the rules. She got one of them wrong, but you know we'll gloss over that. She built a mech quite early on, so she could romp around, get a few upgrades that allowed that mech to move a lot, build a tunnel or jump across water, all that sort of stuff. So obviously as new players, we were slightly intimidated by that, thinking, <laughs> uh-oh. But it didn't stop most of the players putting at least one or two stars down, like making, uh, getting their objective card done and stuff like that. But again, as Steve says, it was mostly because we were all turtling and trying to work out what we could do with the game because there was a, just a lot going on. You know, mm. It's a lot to take in in an hour. Just yeah. avoiding the John Cade suggestion, which is generally... I'll just charge in the first time, see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did that. I, I decided that I need to give this combat a go, and there's, the, there's a victory point up for grabs for doing that. Mm. So it was like, right, I'm going to kick off, because my secret objective was to control the factory space that's in the centre of the board as well. Uh, yeah. However, I only read the first half of the objective, which also said you have to have the most power, and I had the least power. Oops. And I spent half of that power... Get in the factory. Get, get in the factory. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I did exactly that. And that's actually one of the things I was a bit disappointed about the game is you had all these mechs, mm. and you had your character unit as well, which was supposed to be like your yeah, awesome fighter, but there was not that much of combat in it. Combat mm. was there, but combat cost you power, because what you did is you had this power track of how much power you had, and you had to bid how much power you were going to spend in a fight. That's it. Maybe you can explain it, because there was this weird wheel. It yeah. reminded me of Dialer Pirate from Monkey Island. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, because it had it's got it's like a little handle and it's got this wheel with loads of holes in it, almost like a rotary telephone, and it's got numbers in it. Yeah, I guess that, that was that was the bidding. You you've neither of you played Rex, have you? Um, no, Rex, which is a remake of Dune, the board game, it does exactly the same thing. And what you do is when you have a fight, you bid. So you use this wheel to select how oh, okay. much of your power you're going to bid on this fight, and everything anything you bid gets spent. Mm -hmm. So it's basically a bidding competition. Whoever bids the most wins. But uh, Scythe had cards you could play as well. So if you had a combat card, you could play one combat card. Although it's oh, slightly right, different yeah. to a bid because even you're saying even if you if you, if you don't win, you still spend. Yes, yeah, you spend whatever you bid, yeah. and, and Rex works the same. There's a few board games where bidding like that does work. New when you, Earth's like that as well. Yeah. When you bid to take over territory, you can throw as much money at it as you want. Yeah. But you lose it. So there's kind of this hilarious object, hilarious mechanic where you can just run in, start a, a bidding war, just throw in a million. Your opponent chucks in six million. You run away laughing. Yeah. <laughs> but, Game yeah. of Thrones does the same thing. If you ever yeah, played that, yeah, the, okay. at one point you've got to bid on the three tracks. So whoever bids most will become the sitter of the Iron Throne and the head of mm -hmm. the Ravens and, and such okay. like. And that's exactly the same. Whatever you bid gets spent. So you can't you okay. can't go well, put, right. I'm gonna put five in, hoping something else. Put six. And if you put five in, you're spending five. So yeah. uh, that makes a lot more sense now because I was sat at like the, almost the head of the table. Really, was sort of two people either on either side, and the fight was going on at the other end of the table. And of course, at the expo with everything going on around us, we couldn't. Mm. I couldn't really hear what, what they were doing. All I just saw this wheel come up. It got sort of spun round, <laughs> and uh, people played a couple of cards, and a mech was taken off the board. I thought. Well, that was very interesting. What uh, happened there? That's uh, a number wang. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, have I won? <laughs> but yeah, that was one thing. And I also thought that even with five players, the board wasn't crowded enough to start too many fights. 
there were still hexes where which people weren't exploiting. Mm. And I don't think uh, whether we were just being, as you said, a bit turtly because it's the first time we played, so we weren't being too aggressive. Possibly. Which is not like the board game group I play with. It's not like the people I was playing with are not normally aggressive. No. I just felt that it didn't have quite enough combat in it for me. Oh, that was the other one. If you defeated, I think if you defeated workers, you lost one popularity for every worker you killed as well. Yeah, I remember somebody did that. I think they got rid of some of my workers because I had this little army of meeples. Because I, I approach the game as if I approached um, viticulture and just breed workers mm. because you get a lot more actions for it. The problem is inside, it doesn't quite work like that. No, that's exactly <laughs> what I did. I, I'm going to get all my workers out. I'm going to win this way. And the more workers you remove, you move them off this little board again and it reveals how much you have to pay every time you want to do a resource collection action. Mm. So it starts off as like, oh, I've got to lose one power. And then it's, I've got to lose one power and one gold. Mm. Then I've got to lose one power, one gold and one popularity. I get loads of resources because I've got seven mm. meeples out. Mm. But it's going to cost me an awful lot to do this action. Yeah, and I, I misunderstood that I, I kind of assumed because it was a stone mine game, the more meeples you have, the more stuff you could do. And Scythe really isn't like that at all. They're useful, but they're basically miners, yeah. essentially. So if you want a lot of resource, you need a lot of meeples in one go to get them quickly. But of course, you've got to breed this little army. But they're not that good for exploration because they can't cross water and there's lots of water and stuff on the board. So, and you, for that, you need mechs, basically. So, so, when, so when you say miners, you mean people who dig stuff out of the ground, right? Not just children. Not children, <laughs> no, no, no. We're, we're, not, we're not condoning slave labour. Well, you, I don't know. This just is like, yet. This is kind of a communist Russia kind it of was, thing. Yeah, so yeah. It might be. But yes. Okay. No, people basically pulling stuff out of the ground or farmers or anything like that. So essentially they're just workers. They're not military or anything like that. Although hilariously, they can get into the back of mechs and be carried around, if I remember rightly. Yeah, no, that's yeah. that's the best, that's the quickest way of transporting them is you yeah, bundle them yeah. onto a mech and then the mech moves along. Mm, and then you drop them off in a different area yeah. and away they go. But I didn't know that. So, of course, I bred this massive army of meeples, and they were just mining stuff out, this, pulling stuff out of this mountain as quickly as possible. And there's big, literally this pile of stuff on this one hex, and Juliet came along with her mech, lifted it all off, and fucked off. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, hey! So, yeah, that, that was funny. That was a learning experience. It was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, next time I play this game, no meeples. <laughs> Build mechs. Did you find out, because the one thing I never understood, because I don't think we really used it that much, it's possibly because there wasn't that much combat, we didn't play the game for that long, etc, etc. What advantages the character had? Because my understanding was they were basically like a turbo mech. Well, no, they were basically a mech. Yeah. Well, the only difference was when you did the trade action, the resources ended up where your character was, which was really annoying when you had to do, when I was running out of actions to do, because I, was, I basically wanted to do trade, build, trade, build. No, trade upgrade, trade upgrade. And I ended up putting all these resources out in the middle of nowhere because my character was out in the middle of nowhere and I couldn't actually access those resources then because my workers who actually need to be in the same hex to grab them yeah. were three or four hexes away because my leader had gone forward. But basically they were the same as a mech because as you uh, revealed mechs, you revealed powers for the mechs and your hero. Yes, and you can pick which mech you want to deploy in order so you can choose which power. I think everyone has the same powers, they're just in different orders. They well, were they're, subtly they're, broad, they're broadly similar, but not the same. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's right. So, because the, the character I had, the uh, the woman holding an eagle was my oh, yeah, character, yeah, yeah. and their mech had one we can steal combat cards, which I don't think the other players had. Which was quite fun because nobody wants to start a fight with me because it meant that I took <laughs> their combat cards off them before the fight started. <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice. So, I really enjoyed it. Everything kind of you could see how it all worked, how it all the all mechanics. You, know, you do this, you do that, and it did that whole thing that we mentioned a few episodes back, where you know you can't do any everything. You get one action per turn, and then it goes around the table, and you're thinking, right, well, if I want to do this, like for instance, I wanted to get some resources to a particular hex, so I could build a particular thing, and I realised it's going to take me five turns to do that. Yeah, because you can't do the same action twice, and you had to balance. The beauty was, because everyone just goes, oh, I'm doing this, and I grab two resources, it goes around the table really quick. Yes. But it did mean that you're thinking, okay, if someone screws that, if someone moves into that spot, that's going to ruin five turns of my plan. Did you, did you find that, yeah, you were thinking, oh, right, it'll take me three rotations of the board to get there, and then after two rotations, you think, fuck, someone's just... Oh. <laughs> yeah, exactly that. Yeah. And presumably, you've got to be reasonably quiet about it, because if you start giving that stuff away, if there is any hope of salvaging it, then you're... <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, very much so. How did you think the uh, one turn, one action thing 
went because it's very very different to previous stone Mike games well it's different to anything i've ever played before because it feels like a worker placement game because you're taking the action selection. But it but really you, isn't. But it, it definitely isn't, because no. in most worker placement games, you have a pool of workers, you place them all out, then the board gets reset. Yeah. And this is like a one-turn worker placement. Mm. So it felt weird at, at the beginning, because you kind of thought, well, hang on, you know, some of the objectives are at the end of your turn. Well, my turn is like one action. Oh, well, I, I, am I missing something? Is, a, is that a round, or is that a turn? But no, it just, it just one you do one thing. And it even suggests, I think, in the rule book where... If people are doing the bottom row action, you should always be playing the next person's action. Oh, it's like a bit like poker then. No, as in you're like, always playing your opponent's hand. No, no, as in um, so you've got the two rows of actions you can take. Yeah. It suggests that because the bottom one is usually selecting your upgrade or selecting which mech you're going to build or selecting which building you're going to build, mm. that while you're doing that, the person next to you should be having their go. Because what you're doing doesn't affect the board. Oh, it only I see affects you your yeah, board. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So once you get into a rhythm, this game. You know, goes round really, really quick. Mm. That's quite interesting. Yeah. Did you find it? Sort of sounds like from what you guys have said that this uh, game kind of employs a mechanic I'm not a huge fan of, which is that you're you're trying to get these victory points, right? That's mm. the the main aim of it. But do you find that you're doing that sort of in secret? Like, are other players aware of what ones you're building up? They can see. So you've, as I said, you get victory points mostly for clearing most of the things off your little board. Mm. So they can see which ones are on going. He's only got three. He's only got one building left. But yeah, you can't really. I wasn't conscious of what the other players were doing really, because mm. a lot of them were kind of leaving it almost to the last second, so they could do like four turns in a row and get one star. Because everyone was turns. turning. So you weren't really conscious of what people were properly aiming for, and I think that's one of the strategies when you learn the game a bit more, is you start to spot what people are doing and can try and counter mm. that. Mm. But I've, I've always found it a bit frustrating when you have games where. You spend the whole game not really knowing what anyone else has got, so you're all yeah. trying, to, you know, working towards the goal. But there's no, you, you can't see, you know, ah, oh, well, Steve's been hoarding all that stuff and he's about to make a shed load of money, so I need to you... focus my attentions on him. Now, maybe, as you said, it wasn't so combat focused. That's that's why, you know, that it sort of works in this one. Possibly. Yeah. Um. Everything's apart from your secret objective. Everything's two open. Two cards. Isn't it? Everything else is yeah, open. Yeah, yeah. So if you can see people are stockpiling materials, you can see they're stockpiling them. You got. You probably got a pretty good idea. And it was pretty. I mean, obviously as a beginner, it was pretty obvious, probably to Juliet, who's the experienced one, what I was and probably a couple of other people were doing. It's like I want to build a mech, therefore I need four or five lumps of ore and some money. So it's pretty obvious when I start piling this stuff into a hex it's probably pretty obvious what I'm trying to achieve at which point she sort of stomps in robs my stuff and buggers off again mm. but I don't think I've had enough experience with the game to turn around and say I understood any of the tactics really mm -hmm. other than don't build a shitload of meeples in one go no I agree with that actually that's what I did I came fifth yeah. Well, no, fourth, sorry. Yeah. But I, I, I came pretty but one much didn't last. Count. Um, yeah, but. So, yeah, as I said, it's it's probably the the most hyped game at the moment. It's I think it's still top of the hotness charts on Board Game Geek. I can see why. Uh, I can see it's not perfect, but that's the problem with most hyped games. They never quite live up to the hype. But I think it is really good. And as I said, I'm I'm really keen to play it again. Me too. Um, there's a, so. There is a theory in the, group, the Tuesday night group that, that some of the clans, so some of the... the uh, Races are overpowered because I was saying one particular colour seems to win. Four is that out the five red times. one? No, it was the black one they were saying. See, I was playing as the black one. Yeah. And I lost. Okay. <laughs> That's then disproved again. that theory then, hasn't <laughs> it? <laughs> but, well, or it proves another one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was playing it wrong, which I freely admit I was definitely playing it wrong. Yeah. See, I found, I think it's the red one, where they could actually do the same move twice. Yes. I found that. That felt to be quite really powerful. powerful. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. everyone else is massively restricted. You've got to plan two or three turns in advance, whereas this guy could basically do whatever he wanted. So, I don't know. Maybe yeah. it's an advantage, maybe it, it's not. It felt like it was an advantage from the other a strong advantage from the other side of the table. Yeah, yeah. But he came third. Hmm. I think the person who owned that, so. Maybe it is balanced. Yeah, maybe it is balanced. Hmm. Well, I it's supposed to be. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, but so, I mean yeah, we're totally inexperienced. We've all played it well. We've played it once. Well, you two have played it. Once. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have to rectify that. And all three of us playing it. Yeah. When when I get this game. <laughs> <laughs> so that was Scythe. It was Scythe. And um, thumbs up for Scythe. Definitely. Well done, Jamie. 
one thing I was playing actually a couple of weeks ago. In fact, it might be more than a couple of weeks ago now. Time flies when you, you know, your mates are in Scotland. <laughs> He's not <laughs> bitty, you understand? No, not at all. Although he was invited, so that's true. <laughs> that's all right. It's given me time to prep the the uh, the D and D adventure that I'm going to uh, uh, destroy. I mean, um, um, guide you carefully through. And was uh, a game of a game called Flux, which was introduced to by actually my current DM. Chris, he sort of turned up after uh, we'd been playing board games for most of the day and turned around and said, right, here's a, here's a card game I told you about, a game called Flux. Two X's. And we're like, okay, fine, we'll give it a go, no problem. And he said, there's three rules. And we sort of looked at him. Like, what? <laughs> and it literally is. You open the deck, there were, there's no rule book, it's a single card, and you start off with, I think it's three cards each, and you play one card and draw one card to start with. That's it. Every other rule... It is on all of the other cards. The game is so massively dynamic. You'll never have the same game twice, which, okay, you probably say about most games, but most games follow a, you know, I will go over here, then I will do this, then I will do this, and then I will win or lose. Whereas Flux, utterly unpredictable, because one person could play a card and it'll say, right, for, for the next, you know, until this is overridden, everyone draws five cards on their turn. So you can just draw five cards with this huge hand, but you're still only playing one. And then someone will say, you have to discard everything down to one. And all of a sudden, this massive hand that you'd had a huge plan for, you get rid of. The ultimate goal is to to essentially create a set of cards. But that set depends on what someone's played. So there's objective cards in the game, and there's rule cards in the game, and then there's item cards in the game, essentially. And basically, the objective cards are you must have in your hand or or active on the table, uh, usually two items. So you can spend your, your time trying to get these two items, but after you know, a couple of turns, you've got one of them, someone plays a different objective, and it's just knocked into a cocked hat. It's quite good, and you can be really, really mean. It sounds a little bit like that robot stacking game. Oh, um, stack Stackbox. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. A in, little bit, yes. In that the, the cards that you pick up have the rules on them, and that's what you're, yeah. you're following as you, as you Kind of, yes. It's less recursive, mm. but it's along the same lines. Mm. So someone could just play a card, and it would say, you know, um, and some of, the, some of the cards are negative effects as well. So they're kind of viruses, or they're almost like leeches, and they will attach to one particular card. So like you could have, say, Brain in a Jar. And you'll have, say, a brain virus. And that brain virus would be attached to the brain in the jar. And it would say you can't win if, you know, you, you, this brain virus is with this brain. And if, if the objective is you need a brain in a jar and, I don't know, Firefly or whatever, you could have both of those cards. But because you've got the brain virus, you can't win until you get rid of the brain virus. It's fun. It and does sound like it would be fun. Uh, Did you... Is it the original version, so it was just Flux? Or we was played it the two. Ones? We played the original version mm. and we played the Firefly Okay. Uh, themed one. I think I actually preferred the original one, but it was slightly more chaotic. The Firefly one seemed a little less explosive. There was a bit less to it. It seemed a bit smaller, uh, which wasn't a bad thing. But it was probably easier to learn, and obviously because all the characters are familiar, you, you know who who's who and so on and so forth. And it was very well themed, so you could sort of Zoe and a shotgun would be say you know one objective, or you get Jane and the name the gun is, is Vera it? Vera that's it <laughs> Jane and Vera would be an objective card and things like that so it was quite nice to play something so familiar and it was really well done in, in the theme of the show so that was that was quite good uh, but the same overall idea worked you know you still needed a couple of a couple of cards in play and there's an objective card or you, you draw three or you've got a hand size maximum of three at the end of your turn all this sort of general, mm. fairly nothing in it was particularly surprising from from an experienced gamer point of view you've probably seen all of the rules in various games before but throwing it all together in such a dynamic fashion was actually quite a lot of fun okay. and the game could be over in five minutes in literally five minutes you just draw those two cards play the objective bang you're done or in our case it lasted an hour and a half and we still hadn't finished <laughs> Just because of the, 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 the completely random and dynamic nature of the game. So it's like you can't have just a quick game of flux. <laughs> well, you could, but you don't know. It's not one of these where you say, you know, pandemic, it'll take about 45 minutes. Mm. By that metric alone, it ought to be in my collection. Yes. <laughs> yes. I think I think it's very much your type of game, John, because not only is it hugely chaotic, but it's also a game where you can really screw someone and you can actively do it. <laughs> so look at him grinning now. <laughs> I don't know what you're insinuating. <laughs> Why this comes up every podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it, John would like it because I've not played the physical version of the game, but I think I've got it on iOS. So I think I've had right, it on my phone, yeah. which is it doesn't work, I don't think. It's not going to be as fun as a, mm. sitting in a cup amongst your friends and play it. 
But when I played it, it reminded me of one of John's drinking games. Where you've got the, I don't know, what is it, international drinking rules? Yeah, okay. Where, you know, oh, you can't do this, you're supposed to be holding your thumb up your nose, or you, you, you've got yes, a point, or you've got to point yeah, your yeah. elbow. It felt like that. Where, where, That's like, scored, yeah. <laughs> That's the, a different game. Oh. <laughs> where the rules were constantly changing as you were playing it, and it's like, yeah. I can't keep up with this, I don't know what's going on, but without the constant alcohol abuse. It's designed Oh, no, to, you, uh, you can have constant alcohol abuse in folks as well. In yeah. fact, it's probably encouraged. <laughs> designed to keep things fresh so yeah, everything changes all the time mm. like different people are responsible mm. for different things happening and yeah it's, it's very much like yeah, that. it's designed to punish you no matter how good you are at the game <laughs> especially yes. if you start getting stuff wrong mm. i did find that it's almost impossible to have tactics you can have them and you can start to work towards them but because you don't know if your objective is going to change or not you kind of have to plan in about 15 contingencies <laughs> Um, which obviously is very difficult to do, mm. um, or not plan at all, I suppose. Yeah, Just, uh, see what happens. You, you kind of you, you do need obviously to work towards something because there will be at some point an objective on the game. The thing is, you don't start with an objective, so no, everyone's just grabbing cards until <laughs> someone plays one. You don't know what it could be. I mean, you could go around the table for half an hour and no objective card could be played, as everyone's just hoarding cards or or throwing them away and stuff like that. Okay. So until someone plays one, there isn't one. It's mental. Mm. That does sound interesting. Mm. It's a really good feeling. I mean, obviously, it's just a deck of cards. So I can't imagine it's much more than the tenner to buy. It's, no, it's quite, and there's loads of versions of it. Yes, yes, and I, yes. And there's Monty Python was a big one that came mm, out, Monty Python mm. Flux. And, and I found it quite telling. The company who publishes this game is called Looney Labs. I can, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> I think it's quite descriptive. Yes, yes. So, uh, I mean, big thanks to Chris for introducing us to that game because it was really good fun. And then we played three, was it two or three games of it? So one of the normal one and one or two of the Firefly one. Yeah, they were, they were really, really good. I really enjoyed it. Mm. That was that was Flux. Sounds a bit like uh, Munchkin in some ways, in the way you've got lots of different themed bits and a bit of chaos in there. It's definitely that corner of the market. Yeah. So if you're someone who does like Munchkin, you're probably going to like Flux as well. Munchkin card game? Yeah. Right, mm. yeah. Uh, but if you're someone who hates Munchkin with a passion, which I know there are a lot of people out there who do, then Flux probably isn't your thing. <laughs> <laughs> probably want to oh. avoid it. So, multi universum Yes, one game I really want to talk about is multi universum mainly because we've all played the game. It's a good start, to be fair. It is a good start, mm. which usually we don't usually start on that strong no, basis, no, do we? No. Uh, and they've got a Kickstarter at the moment for the first expansion for the game. It's come out quick, though. I mean, the game itself was out presumably before Games Expo, but it wasn't out that much it longer. It wasn't out that much longer before the Expo, and I think the Expo was kind of the hard launch, as it were. Because they was had a... lots and lots of copies there. Yeah, they, they, were, they were prepping it before then. You could buy it before then, but mm. I think it was just like a week before or something. Because that was like what, end of May? And we're now at the middle of August? It's June, so, yeah, yeah. beginning of June. That's what, a couple of months, that's really yeah. good. So, so an, 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 an expansion already, that, that does suggest the game is doing well. Yes. So... As a brief explanation of what multi universum is. So it's a, a little game, a card game. Yep. It's for one to five people for ages 12 and over. Well, that's well, us out. <laughs> Men, <laughs> I think that's probably physical age, not, not just oh, mental age. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, according to the box, it takes 20 to 40 minutes, which I don't think that's. That's not our experience of the game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then, as we've established in previous podcasts, uh, we don't always take the quickest route through a game no. <laughs> to be fair I played this when we were in Scotland with Amanda so we played a two player game and it took about half an hour you two played it and it took us an hour and a half so you said that about imps as well it's, are you it's yes. suggesting that John and I are meticulous verbose. meticulous yeah I like meticulous. that yeah, 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 yeah. You, could say over, you could say meticulous you could say overthinking <laughs> you could say obstinate I don't know <laughs> pick, pick your phrase yeah, there's a few words I could say right now Mr. Tudor <laughs> yes. yeah, we know which one you've picked <laughs> I, don't, I don't think our read, uh, readers uh, our listeners need to hear those words <laughs> no so not until just, later did you just hold something back I know I, ex- I that, that, what's that word that begins with R that I never use <laughs> Restraint. Mm. That's it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Restraint. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's quickly becoming my catchphrase in this podcast. <laughs> so I try and tether these and herd these cats back into the podcast of which we want to talk about. Well, you asked us to be here. I think we're all as guilty as each other. That decision, to be fair. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Anyway. <laughs> anyway, so it's a card game. It, multi listen It's a card game where the theme is soon have turned on the particle accelerator. And it's opened up portals to other dimensions. 
Predictable. Has anyone <laughs> played Half Life? Yes, <laughs> it's very similar thing to Half Life. And your job is you are one of the scientists in CERN, and for some reason you're in competition with all your colleagues, and you have to explore and close these portals. Theory being that the the residents of these other dimensions don't particularly like you and are invading, so you need to shut them to stop them invading. It's fair enough. Yeah. yeah, not everyone likes their neighbours. No, and not not a cake in sight. No. How you do this though is where this game is really interesting. Interesting, yeah. It is. The mechanics are different, mm. but quite good. Yeah. So you have five different generators, which represent the five different generators which have been used to open up these portals. And then you have a set of cards in your hand, of which there are five actions on each card, which are colour coded for each of the generators. So you can only take an action which you're on the card which represents the colour your meeple is currently standing on. So that's each of the generators has got a different colour. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So And these cards that you've got that can do things, they will have um, different actions on different colours. And different cards for the same generator colour have different actions that you can do. Yes. Mm. And each card has a different set of actions for each colour. So not everyone's the same. So every card is basically different. Yes. I think that's just what I, I think, said. I is think, it? No, <laughs> I think we've said that three times now. Have okay, we? so right. now that we're sure. We're, we're clear on that right. now. <laughs> <laughs> on the right-hand side of the card is a symbol of some form of laboratory equipment, mm. like a microscope, or there's uh, chemicals, or there's nuclear thingy-mob, you know, swirly atom Biohazard thing. And yeah. And that sort of stuff, yeah. And to close portals, you need to install these cards into your lab, which is oh. basically put the cards out in front of you and store them up. And portals have one of... One, two, or three requirements to shut them. And a portal that requires one to shut is going to be the lowest amount of point, victory points. The one with the highest is going to be, funnily enough, the highest amount of victory points. So not only do you need to have your meeple on the right portal, have an action card which has the closed portal action for that colour generator and portal. You also have inst- to have installed in your lab the necessary equipment to close that portal. Also, these portals are in stacks. And certain actions can rearrange these stacks. Which is, I think, why our game took so long when we played. Because rather than trying to close portals, we were trying to screw up whoever was prepping to close a portal and basically put them two steps back. You say we. I quite enjoyed that game. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, Mr John Cage was spending most of his time screwing everyone else's game up. Well, there's two ways to win, really, isn't there? (laughs) Annoyingly, he was quite good at it as well. (laughs) And practised. You know, there's the main thing that you obviously need to get your own points. But the other thing is you've got to make sure that no one else gets the points. So you've got to... Yeah, it was a valid strategy. Mm. It was working, except that I spent more time just trying to stop Steve than actually gaining any points myself. Now, there are also some bonus points depending on which portals you close, which dimensions you close, because all dimensions have got a little symbol in the corner, and if you match certain symbols, you can get bonus points. I've got to admit, most games, that hasn't really come into it, because most people are rushing to close portals as quickly as possible, which means they get the points as quickly as possible. Mm. I was going to say, I don't don't think those bonus points ever, ever entered our game at any point. No, they didn't really... I think I might have even said because it was the first game we played to ignore them. I think we did. Yeah, yeah and then oh, I, I think I added up the points afterwards and it didn't make any much difference because none of us had matched anything anyway, <laughs> even out of pure luck. I got close on one and then I realised there were points to be had in the near term and I thought, sod it. What I would say is this game is really nice looking. Mm. It's, it is. The artwork's very, very nice. It's very clear, very bold, very coloured, very patterned. All the icons are very different. There's no it's like you, you can't you can tell the difference between you know, a cloud and a, a water droplet, for example. And some mm. games I've seen, it's like mm, which ones are which. But no, yeah. it's really good. So you mean the graphic design? Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Does it pass our uh, limited subset of colour blindness testing? It does actually. Yeah. Mm. Well, kind of. I mean, looking at one right now, they are unique. I mean, I couldn't turn around and look at this card and say, ooh, that's green, but I probably can. The blue-purple one, I couldn't tell you honestly if that's blue or purple, but I it doesn't be. actually matter because it's different to all of the others, yeah. so it's fine. And, and they're yeah. numbered as well. Yeah. They're numbered so they're in the same sequence. I would also say the art as well is really good because all the the main cards you play with are just graphic design cards. They've just got logos on them. Mm, but mm. the cards that represent the dimensions, each card has got unique art on it which represents the alternative dimension. And you've got like a, a murderous jelly baby. Things along those lines. Yeah. It's the, really one, pretty the one thing, I now you mentioned the colour blindness thing, I did struggle with the colours of the actual generators between yellow and green. Right. 
the two cards. The rest of the other three were fine, so white, mm. red, and blue. They, they were subtly different, they're suitably different, rather. But the yellow and green ones, I did struggle with a little bit. But that's because my eyes don't work. For anyone with normal vision, I'm sure it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, they're fine on the cards. I can tell the difference completely because one looks like kind of urine yellow and the other one sort of jade green. It's fine. But the two cards, the, the generator cards, were a, yeah. bit, a bit too similar. For and my, the logo on the eyes. cards, because the generators have all the special abilities as well, you can activate. I think the logo on that was quite small, so you probably couldn't see that clearly from a distance. What logo? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's, it's a nice little multi-option game where, again, you're trying to think two or three cards in advance. I think there's a, there's a couple of things that break it a little bit. One of the actions is you can recycle, which is basically go through the discard pile and grab a card. Mm. And I found that almost too powerful because what you tend to do is, right, I need this card to get a strategy, right, I'll take a recycle action. Oh, there's about 40 cards in that discard pile. I'm going to find what I want, no matter yeah. what that. Yeah, I can see what you mean. I found that a little bit annoying, but it also meant you were spending an action to do that, so potentially you were wasting one of your three actions every round. Yeah, oh. I don't remember it really being a hindrance, though, doing that. No. Maybe because know. every you know all of us, every single turn, pretty much, again, and I'll go and recycle that one. Yeah. And <laughs> I think Steve cottoned onto it slightly quicker than certainly than I did, and once he started recycling stuff, I'm thinking, hang on a minute, he's up to something. And you got to a point where you could look at an action go right I need this card and this card and this card I don't have that one right I need to recycle bang therefore I've got five cards now we were kind of in the fortunate position or I was because then you turned around and screwed him which was great <laughs> so it ruined his plans but I can see what Steve means that you're essentially just waiting for the, the three cards that you need or whatever it is and then you just rifle through the discards deck and go right there's the card I need you do, you do have to wait for the discard action to come up on one of your cards, but once you had that, I found that yeah. you could basically mm. do what you wanted. So essentially, this is you know pick up the cards you want. Yeah, that's essentially what it is. Such, so but as you say, it does use an action. So, mm. what well, I think is also quite good about this is that we've played it one, two, and three player now. So I've played it. I played the solo variant. I played it with Amanda and played it with you guys, and it works at those counts. I've not played it with five players. It goes up to five maximum. That's about six hours with us playing. Well, <laughs> <laughs> probably more. <laughs> But there would be a lot of fun involved. Yeah. And probably and quite that, a few swears. I can imagine that would be a lot more chaotic. Mm. Because when we found with the free player, it was quite chaotic. Because, again, it was one of those things you couldn't plan too far in advance because someone would screw up your plans. So you mm. had to take advantage of what happened. Do the portal decks scale with the players? Because no. there was, a, was it five, five cards no, in each deck um, for the portals? Oh, like God. That. I'm going to say no. Okay. It's probably wrong, but I'm going to say no. Because mm. it's, yeah, it's one, two decks... Oh, no, it's the number. No, the end conditions change. Oh. So I think the, the game ends when a certain number of portal decks are depleted, and I think that number increases for the number of players. Okay. So the game lasts a little bit longer with more players because you can grab them quicker. I seem to remember it being two for us. Yes. There's three of us playing. So presumably for a five player game, maybe. I think. I may have that completely wrong. Mm. It wouldn't <laughs> be the first time. It wouldn't be the first time, it won't be the last time. Mm. <laughs> no. This is Board and Dice, which is a Polish game company. Mm -hmm. And I think I've said in the past, this is one of the companies, I think, especially if you're in America, because you probably don't are aware of them as much, to keep an eye on. They're part of this Polish public... In, public blah, 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 blah. Put your teeth in, Steve. <laughs> They're part of the Polish public... <laughs> Polish, Polish, Polish publican. Pub publicans, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Polish publican league. They do some good beer. <laughs> <laughs> Board and Dice are part of the Polish Publishing League. And it's not a uh, it's not some sort of you know special collection of supervillains either. <laughs> no. The Polish Legion of Doom. <laughs> and are Phalanx part of this? Presumably yes, they, they were. Yeah, yeah because yeah. that's where we saw them um, at the UK Games Expo. They're all sharing a stand, and they share. A if you go to Essen, they are all. Sharing the stand together yes. at Essen as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said they're, they're, keep an eye out for them, especially if you're in America, because you won't have seen them as much as we do in mm. Europe, because there's some really interesting games coming out from them. Yeah, I was going to say, because I mean, the polls are looking really good at the moment. So, so with Hannibal, with the new one from Phalanx, it's the name I forget, which is similar to Hannibal, Multi Universe from here. Yeah. Uh, and even at, even at the expo, there were some games on there that looked really, really good. So mm. the polls are definitely one to watch at the moment. Mm. So one reason I wanted to mention Multi-Universum today is because they've got this expansion out on Kickstarter at the moment. Mm -hmm. So you, if you haven't already got the game, you can buy that as part of your pledge on Kickstarter. That's quite cool. And it is the Cthulhu expansion. <gasps> 
Oh, and you're not, you're not talking about this at all. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've already ordered it. Uh huh. So, for those of you that are getting bored of Cthulhu and everything, yes, I'm part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the only problem. I think we're going to have to start introducing a ding for that, you know. Uh huh. <laughs> Shouldn't just be talisman <laughs> that gets that noise. Well, I, I'm thinking at this point, we, we've, got, we've got the talisman for you. We need something for every time Andy mentions Jamie Stonemeyer, mm, Stegmeyer, and Stonemeyer games. games yeah. And maybe I need something for every time I mention Cthulhu. <laughs> I think that's probably fair. Yeah. And the answer is, you know, equal opportunities and everything. Mm. Write in to suggest <laughs> noises. <laughs> what well, noise would you associate with <laughs> Stonemaier Games? <laughs> Cthulhu. A <laughs> choir <Talisman>. of angels. <laughs> <laughs> we just need an ominous chord every time I mention Cthulhu. Dun. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not that, but... <laughs> It's a good idea, actually. So, Kickstart at the moment, multi universum Cthulhu expansion. Go check it out. It's a really nice little game. And it's a little game as well. It's a you know, small box game. Mm. It'll you probably should... fit in a large pocket. Yeah, you should be able to play it in half an hour, unless you're playing with these two Muppets. <laughs> I think we should rebel, John. Harsh, but ultimately fair. <laughs> yes, yes. I would argue, but he's right. <laughs> <laughs> Another Kickstarter game, on Kickstarter at the moment... Miniatures game where you take on a team of vampire hunters in modern day, and funnily enough, you're hunting oh, vampires. Hello. So when you say take on, you mean you take you, the role of yes, take the role of modern vampire hunters, break into a vampire den during the day. As you do. Well, it's better to do it then than. Well, night. that's this is where the game gets quite interesting. So you break in during the day, and your aim it's scenario based, but generally you'll break in, have to complete an objective and avoid waking up the vampires and hopefully killing most of them in their sleep and then get out. Avoid killing them in their sleep? No, no, avoid the vampires or avoid waking them or or kill them in their sleep. That makes more sense. Right. (laughs) So it's a miniatures-based game, so if you look on the Kickstarter, it's one of those games where the miniatures are front and centre. Of course. So you've got miniatures for the... the Blingtastic. Yeah, miniatures for the hunters, miniatures for all the vampires, or some miniatures for the elder vampires, which are supposed to be like the the one everything's... Are they all the uh, stretch goals? No, no, they're actually part of the game. The the elder vampires are part of the game. I think there are some stretch goals for miniatures for some other things like doors and windows and furniture and things like that. Best thing about the vampires. (laughs) (laughs) If you haven't seen that video about hero quests, go and uh, Google it now. It's very funny. No, not now. Wait till the end of the podcast. Then do. (laughs) Well, and come back. That's fine. Okay, we can can go say that. Yeah, that's Mm. fair enough. So, I mean, I played a print and play version. The guys at Dark Gate Games sent me the files to a print and play and I don't usually do print and play reviews of kickstart stuff because you basically spend half a day cutting out and gluing things and it mm. get a bit of a faff and you but print this, it all out and the paper's just that wet from the amount of ink yeah used. it's all a little bit wrinkled uh. so I did a little bit of improvisation there's a review of it on the website on playhedroncollider.com where I've taken all the miniatures from Mansions of Madness because <laughs> they're the same scale and a zombie looks a bit like a vampire how big are they then? So it's 28mm, I think it's 28mm. So. Okay. Um, they might actually be 30mm miniatures. So that's the scale of the miniature is supposed to be that is the distance from the foot to the eye. So I think Warhammer is 28mm. Mm. Yes. 40k is what they call 28 heroic, which means it's. Yeah, yeah, basically, <laughs> that is just the pose, but it's disproportioned. Yeah. If you look at Space Marine, it actually. Superimpose a real body over a Space Marine power arm. It doesn't quite fit. quite also uh, embellished. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I said I played this game. I played it solo because I'll be honest with you, I was running a little bit behind on reviews, so I wanted to get it out before we went away for Scotland as well. So I played it solo. I played the first game and died in two turns. Impressive. Skills. Basically, because I walked into a room and the elder vampire was in the room. He woke up. He ate me. <laughs> As they do. Second game, I was a little bit more cautious, realised what I'd done wrong strategically, got to the final boss, he ate me. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is a good thing, because it shows you this game's quite hard. I quite like the sound of this, actually. Yeah. yeah. I like vampires and vampire lore, so mm. I'm, I'm quite interested in this. What's really interesting is, you, I said you said earlier, it's better to invade during the day. Well, yes, but time ticks on, and you've mm. got so many turns to do things during the day, and then it becomes night. Mm. when it becomes night all the vampires are already on the board wake up and so all of a sudden you have a problem on your hands 
That's a pretty big problem. It is a pretty big problem. So there's some strategy you've got to choose. Do you go through and systematically wipe out all the vampires you see in their sleep? Because you can insta-kill them in their sleep. Hope you don't wake any of them up. In or killing them. So presumably they squeal a bit when you kill them. So, um, there are rent cards when you go into a room and some of them set traps so they can... Okay. Uh, like some of them actually have guard dogs. So the dog, but the dog barks when you come in and wakes all the vampires up in the room. This is slightly thematically similar to Fury of Dracula, actually. Uh, imagine if it's Fury of Dracula just concentrated on one city. So yeah, yeah. One I don't, I don't mean it's yeah. travelling around. It's thematically similar to another vampire <laughs> game. <laughs> Is that, Piece off cage. is that what that's, you're saying? That's Andy? not what I meant. <laughs> what are the chances Mecha- of that? Mechanically, then. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've got something right then, haven't they? <laughs> um, <laughs> there are times you can go off, your colleagues. There really are. What I mean is, in the sense that this. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, Steve's lost it. <laughs> <laughs> we should video this. <laughs> Oh god, the videos do look awful. Um, well, that's because you're an ugly bastard, Steve. Oh, well, yeah, exactly. Mm. That's why Gosh. I decided to write reviews and mm. do podcasts that's and not do idea. video you've episodes. You've the face for radio. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean is, in the sense that you can go into an, into an area in Fury Dracula and it could be trapped. Yes. Or you know, there are actions during the day in Fury and there's actions during the night where Dracula and stuff does, and obviously there's elevated chances of encountering vampires mm. in the night. So is all I mean. You cheeky bastard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I get it. <laughs> I found it was a really interesting game. I said I played a couple of games of this print and play a bit hobbled together a bit. Mm. So I, okay, I can't comment on the quality of the components because I don't know what they're going to be like. But the art was good, the graphic design was good and functional mm-hmm. and stand everything. Fully cooperative. So that was good. you're playing against the board and all the vampires are kind of... Um, there's a card that says, right... These vampires move towards you. These vampires search the next room. That kind of okay. thing. Okay. Is there an option for one person to play as the vampires? I believe kind of like Space Crusade type. I believe they're or putting that War. as an optional rule. Okay. Uh, but also, you can be turned. So if you get fully attacked by a vampire, your player oh. character turns into a vampire. <laughs> Not like that, Andy. Because <laughs> no, I'm halfway there already. You know? <laughs> what was that in? Do you guys ever read Grail Quest? No. Grail Quest was a, a series of books very similar to Fight and Fantasy and Choose Your Own Adventure. Oh, right, yeah. And I actually read them before I read Fight and Fantasy books. It sounds familiar. And the first one, you're storming this like evil dark castle. It's what Grail Quest was supposed to be like the uh, King Arthur and the you know the Holy Grail. Yeah. So you're after the Holy Grail. And you come across a coffin, you open it thinking there's a vampire outside, and it is the campest vampire in the world. He comes out <laughs> and goes, Oh, hello, Ducky! <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Outstanding. <laughs> It's so random. Presumably, you don't, you, don't, you don't kill this particular vampire with a stake through the heart. You give him a really bad denim shirt to put on. <laughs> you're killing I'd me. You're die. killing me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Was, is there, there's um, potentially a, a one versus many mechanic. I believe so. Yes, but okay. it's, it's designed off the bat as being a completely cooperative game okay. where you play against the game, which I quite like because. Although I like those one versus many games, I mean, I'm a big fan of Imperial Assault and Descent and the old Hero Quest. Won't sold. <laughs> being that person who's the, the, the baddie can sometimes feel as if you're being ganged up over one. I really do like cooperative games, so. Uh, so I quite like them just because I can just be vindictive. Yeah. But then again, I'm, that? I'm the arsehole type. There is that as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, is there um, also how does how does the the game then decide how a vampire moves towards somebody? Is it just like right, you will it's, find it's, the nearest. Yeah, you, you turn over this thing. card and there's four actions on it. So the the first action can be blank, but it might be like all vampires in the room wake up. Second action will be a vampires in range move towards the active player. Then there's like another one which is a random one, and then the last one will be vampires move towards the nearest target. And, and it's usually in the middle. It's like all vampires attack. Right. So some, it's like basically they move a bit, they attack, then they move again, ready for the next turn. So you're like, mm, uh, I don't want to be overpowered in that biome. Okay, so is it like a collective, right, we'll put the vampire moving towards the corner so he doesn't hurt us, or is the guidelines... No, 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 it, 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 it says things like the vampire will move towards the active player, yeah. the vampire will move towards the nearest player. Or the, it'll move towards the door or something like that. Yeah, or uh, okay, move towards okay. the room with the nearest player. It's sure, definite sure, rules sure. that force those vampires, okay, usually, sure, sure. towards you. Yeah, right, yeah. Well. Okay, that's fair enough. Mm. Now, it is a miniatures game, so it's a bit 
as a lot of people would say, are very trashy. As far as, so there's lots of dice, lots of cards, lots of tokens. Right. As far as miniature games go, is are these like, I mean, because I've got miniature games and at risk of setting off another Dean. There are certain games I, I've got in my collection. <laughs> that, no, that, they have miniatures in them. No, Talis- not... Talisman is not a miniatures game. Talisman is a game which has miniatures mm. because wonky miniatures that fall over and are very bent now. Yes, <laughs> not like, like that, the... Andy. <laughs> That's uh, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> that sounds like Betrayal like House on the Hill. One of the miniatures oh. in that came out of the box, and honestly, it was at forty-five degrees. Which I think is a common fault because mine was like that. Yeah, yeah. Was it the girl? Yeah, yeah. It's just like, what? Are you drunk, woman? <laughs> I've got a swashbuckler. He's got a very bent sword. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a miniatures game, as in it's highly quality miniatures. The miniatures are going to represent everything. So every single figure on the board. Nice be, resin. Yeah. yeah. So like, yeah. think if you hear a question, you space crusade. When yeah, I say yeah. a miniatures board game. That's the kind of game I'm thinking of. Mm. You hear a quest, your Space Crusade, your Imperial Assault, your Descent. So, f- for anyone interested in potentially backing this game, <coughs> w- w- when does it um, expire? Oh, you're going to put me on the spot now, aren't you? Roughly. I mean, are we talking August or September? Uh, it's end it, of August. It's going it's to be it's... in, and then cut that in, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be, it's in a couple of weeks, I think. It's okay. not far off. Sure, sure. As, we are, I think, halfway through the Kickstarter campaign as we're recording this. Okay, so sure, sure. If, if you're listening to this podcast episode not long after it's released, I think you've got about a week. Okay. So if you're, if you're fresh to the podcast, it's about a week. A lot of companies now are doing Kickstarters where you can actually pre order it and get most of the Kickstarter backing rewards, I've noticed. Yeah, once the campaign's finished, they either do an extended sort of backing or there's a couple mm. of, there's a couple of campaigns I've backed that have done this uh, Arve Roma was one of them actually uh, they added like an extra month to it I mean they'd, they'd closed the campaign but they said look you know if you want to, if you want to you know order extra copies or back it from future you can do that which is quite cool actually because a month whilst waiting for it to, sh- to, to, to sort of close and, 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 and get a shift on when you put your money down a month isn't actually that long to hear about a game, do its research, and then decide you want to buy it. So you've really got to sort of get your get your act together and, and, and stick your money down quickly. So adding an extra couple of weeks or whatever it is, I think it's quite a good, quite a nice idea. Even if you lose out on maybe like one miniature or something, if yeah. they, you know, they just say, "Well, we're not going to do that because you weren't quick enough." But here is ninety five percent of the rest of it. That's pretty nice. So. Mm. That sounds more reasonable, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Um, it sounds like it's going to finish at the same sort of time as Crisis then. That yes, it's not far of off. Yeah, Crisis is a really long campaign. Two well. months. Yeah. Which surprised me, but it does allow me to budget. I, which wonder, is nice. I wonder if that's hurt it at all. Mm. It is coming out quite quickly, though, because I think it's due out in November this year, maybe December. It's, it's definitely 2016. Out in time for Essen. And uh, the multi universe expansion we mentioned earlier, there's mm. actually an option on that to pick up Essen. So. so that's that's the next big release date. Because that's October? Yeah, mm. that's mid October. Mm. That's quite cool. So mm. I'll be rubbing my hands with glee. Mm. And looking at a bank account and, and crying. crying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do that every day anyway. So yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I really enjoyed Vampire Hunters. I thought it was a really interesting premise and being fully cooperative I thought was really good as well. Mm. Is yeah. it currently kickstarting? Obviously, presumably the RRP is obviously going to be higher because that's how it works, but are we, are, we, are we assuming it's going to be somewhere between 60 and 70 quid? I've no idea at this point how much the retail cost is going to be. How much is it on Kickstarter? Um, I suppose is the ultimate question. Man looks up thing on phone. <laughs> it is. And, and cut it in, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> and while we wait, here's a little music. <laughs> do, 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 do. Basic pledge <laughs> is 90 US dollars. Wow, okay. That's pretty high then. Well, that's not, not, not unreasonable for a miniatures not, game. Not, fine, not, but... not unreasonable for a game full of miniatures. And yeah, that you get a couple of Kickstarter exclusives with that. And of course, you get all mm-hmm. the stretch goals. Sure. Again, it doesn't include shipping, which seems to be a common thing now. Yeah, that's, I mean, shipping is usually somewhere in the order of ten to fifteen dollars. This is Italian. It's Italian designer, so I don't know where it's been manufactured. No, more than like it's been manufactured in China because everything is manufactured in China. Mm-hmm. So I don't know where it's shipping from at this point. But sure. So that was Vampire Hunters. It's on Kickstarter now. You've probably got a few days left from the time we post this podcast. Go give it a look. Mm-hmm. So one game we played. Well, me and John have both been away in Scotland. So one of the things we did. In your not like that, not like that. <laughs> Our wives were there as well, not like that. <laughs> not like that. <laughs> Keys in bowls <laughs> <laughs> away in the wilds of Scotland where no one can see us play Eldritch Horror. Yeah, <laughs> so we played Eldritch Horror, which is perfect for somewhere like when we go away in Scotland because it's a game which takes hours 
I think five hours. I think it took us to play that game, didn't it? It was good. Yeah. I was just t- another Cthulhu game, Steve. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Bong. Yeah. <laughs> just, just checking. So yes, this is a Cthulhu game. In fact, it's part of Fancy Flight Games Cthulhu Mythos kind of range because they're doing loads of games in this range at the moment. It's a evolution of Arkham Horror. So it's taking a lot of the ideas. It's almost like the sequel to Arkham Horror, I would call it. Mm. Taking a lot of concepts from Arkham Horror, streamlining and chaining them. I'm trying to make it a more modern game because Arkham Horror is an old game. It was originally released the same kind of time as Talisman. <laughs> so you're looking you know, mid, mid-80s. Mm-hmm. And it got updated when it got re-released in the 2000s, but it's still got a bit of that clunkiness that comes from those old games. Whereas Elder Horror, they clean slate, change the setting slightly so it's still set in like 1920s, but instead of being set in one town, it's set across the entire world. So it's almost like it's almost like Pandemic Cthulhu, bizarrely, because you've got a world map and you're just doing the same, exactly the same thing. You're trying to stop an ancient one from breaking through the, the dimensional portals mm-hmm. and overtaking the world. How you win slightly different from Arkham. In Arkham, you win by closing portals. In Elder Horror, you win by completing a set of objectives. And these objectives are taken from a deck of cards. They change, they vary from game to game, but they also vary from um, Great Old One. So that's the, the great bad evil thing that's trying to break through. So depending on which nasty <coughs> monster, you get different objectives that you have to... Okay. Yeah, it's sure, all sure. heavily thematic based on which monster. And presumably that, that monster's drawn at the start of the game, so you know which one's trying to break through, which therefore shapes the, the yeah. rest of the game. Okay, right. So you're basically running around the world. Portals are opening in different countries and cities. You're moving from city cities, like Indiana Jones style. It's that kind of old style map as well. Trying to close portals, trying do, to do grab you get the spells. red line when you move across the map. Ding, 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 ding. Not a oh. red line, but you do get different coloured lines. Yeah, you do get a, you get a yellow dotted line, which is the wilderness ones. Which awesome. is exactly, so when you're trying to go to the middle of the Congo, or you're trying to get to the pyramids. You got this little yellow dotted line to say it's like a, in the middle of nowhere. Outstanding. That's, no more parachutes. <laughs> and that's one big difference actually to Arkham Horror. Whereas in Arkham Horror, you're always just moving like a space. You've got a certain number of moves that you can do. In this, uh, depending on which source of uh, link there is from one space to another, you might be getting a boat. You might be traveling through the wilderness, which takes obviously a lot longer. Mm. You might be getting on a train. Some characters got some advantages to um, moving faster on some of those things as well. Mm. So it's a bit different in that respect. And it makes you, you have to plan things very differently. You can't just, so in Arkham Horror, you can change they, they call it your focus, so you can make yourself run faster for a couple of turns, but you'll be less, uh, less fighty or less oh, thinking. Oh, that's right, yeah, because yeah. you can move three sliders up and down, can't you? Yeah, in, in that's the it. So instead of, having that's the, right. instead of having that adjustment that you can make, you're limited to a certain number of actions. And you've also got stats as well, which are your dice rolls, so when you ever do a test, you've got five different stats, which you'll pull up when you're doing okay. tests and various things. Sure, sure. But those don't alter like they do in Arkham, they're set for your character. They can improve... Mm-hmm. Within the latest expansion, they can actually get worse as well. But generally, that's what your character is, and that's what your character does. And it's you're, you're limited to two actions a turn, and you've got various actions you can choose from. So, are the characters preset, or are they fixed, or are they? Can you modify them slightly to start the game? You right. I've got all but one expansion, so I've got a stack of about fifty characters you can choose from when you play this now. Okay. That's but you, we basically run it. You, I play it, deal two randomly to each player. They pick from those two what they want to do. And each each card's basically fixed. Yeah, yeah. Each card right. is fixed, okay, and that's your sure, character. Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah. You, you never roll your own character at the start. Okay. So, so you could, yeah. well, the way Steve plays it, you pick one of a couple, mm-hmm. yeah. and then yeah, go from there basically. Okay. Cool. Cool. There's some really interesting ones actually. So I was a smuggler basically, which meant that I could do some extra moves along the railway lines because I used to do that sort of stuff before the world went bad. Mm. <laughs> but there was also a character who was so in in Arkham, you get um, cursed or blessed, which means that when you roll a dice, normally you roll a dice. If you get a five or a six, you pass that. If that's a success. Mm-hmm. If you get anything else, it's a fail. If you're cursed. You only win if you get a six, mm. and if you're blessed, you obviously get four, five, That's six. six. Yeah. We had a character who was permanently cursed, so he could never. <laughs> he, he only ever. He got loads of bo- other bonuses as a you know recompense. Was for this that. you? Yeah. No, no, this was Dave actually. But, yeah. yeah, and it, that character was really interesting because every time he lost the curse, he'd be able to improve one stat 
but then was immediately recursed. Yeah. <laughs> so, and every time that happened, every time he got the curse, bad stuff tended to happen. Yeah. But other bit aspects of his character improved. Well, that's <laughs> one of the really cool things about Eldritch Horror, which wasn't in Arkham, was that curse is a condition, and there's lots of different conditions. So you can have amnesia, you can have a debt, you can have a broken limb. You can See, that be- could be a bit inconvenient. Well, and, and, and generally most of them are. Yeah. Detained is a condition. And you get these conditions, and what it, several of these conditions have this kind of red and white symbol that looks like the Earth being torn apart by a comet. And randomly, the Mythos deck, which is kind of the, the automation of the games that says what's going to happen, how many monsters are going to move, and that kind of thing, randomly some of them will have this symbol on. Oh. And when that happens, it's called the reckoning. You have to do the reckoning on these cards. It'll be things like if you've got a debt condition, someone's come to collect the debt. If you've got like a hallucination, you'll find out what your hallucinations actually are. If, like me, you thought, oh, I need a bit of extra resource and someone's willing to make a dart pact with me, <laughs> how bad could the you know could the bad stuff that you get from a dart pact be? And it, did, it, it, did it turn out very? Well, Fortunately, it never activated, but if it had, it would have been utterly dire. <laughs> uh, but I love, like, even, there's loads of little touches in that. Like, the artwork's really good. And so mm. the um, the back of this card, I just sat there staring at for quite some time in this game, thinking, should I have really done that? Because uh, I'm a bit worried now, but there's a picture of a guy, basically. He's got, like, his forearm in the front of the picture, and you can see he stabbed a quill into his arm and he's then right, signing something with a really pained expression on his face. <laughs> <laughs> just little touches like that. Yeah. Just, uh, nice. Every so often you sat there, yeah, maybe that wasn't such a good idea. <laughs> what a game's really good is when some of those effects chain. So I think the first game we ever played, one of the guys I was playing with did the Arctic Expedition. He fell and he broke his leg. And then... When he revealed the broken leg, it did something else. Like he tripped and fell and banged his head, and it did. Oh, he got a bad. That was a bad back. But the best, the best one was he got the debt condition. So you can take at any point, you can take a debt to buy more stuff. So what you don't, you don't have cash in it. You have to roll successes on this uh, negotiation skill. The amount of successes determines what you can buy. But at any point, you can take a debt, which is a bank loan, effectively, sure. to go and grab more cash. But when you take this debt, you don't know whether because the backs of these cards are all different. No. So you don't know whether you've taken a bank loan or something off a loan shark. <laughs> so he took this, this bank debt, it reckoned, it was a loan shark, they beat him up and bashed him in the head and gave him amnesia. <laughs> the following turn, the amnesia triggered, and he'd forgotten that he hadn't paid the debt, so he'd taken another debt card. <laughs> <laughs> And there's loads of little touches like that. So it, even in um, Arkham Horror, you've got spells, but there's you know, there's a defined cost for it. Like it might cost you some sanity, or it might co- might cost you some you know physical strength or something. Mm. In Eldritch Horror, the the effects of the spells you don't know until you cast it the first time because everything's on the back of the card. So and all then... you can see is what what you'll get as a good result. Right. But it might do a load of other stuff that you're not expecting. Yeah. <laughs> and generally, those are based on the number of successes you roll when you cast the spell. So if you roll like none, it usually backfires and does something really bad. So you might get away with it scot-free every time, or... <laughs> <laughs> but I like the, the cards aren't always the same, so generally, okay, no successes equals you're going to get pert, lots of successes isn't good, but occasionally they'll flip, and you'll go, right, I've got five successes. You'll flip over the card, it's like, oh, you've unleashed cosmic hell, spawn five monsters on your space, or something like that. <laughs> It's going to put a crimp on your day, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was the first time I played it, but I really enjoyed it. And I think um, I think it was less, like you say, it was more streamlined version. Mm. I think that really really did make a difference. It's Originally, when I first started playing it, it felt like it was quicker than Arkham Horror. Mm. But I'm, I've come to the conclusion it's not actually quicker. What it is, it's less faffy. Yeah, I'd agree with Cause that. Because one of the problems with Arkham Horror is a lot of the effects stack... So you pick a card that goes, oh, right, there's a blizzard in town, it lasts for six turns, everyone's got minus one to this ability. Okay, it's that card. Then you pick another card that says such and such is happening, which everyone has. And someone would have to keep track of, like, five you cards. cards at the edge of the board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. having effects. One of the things this did is, like, you can only have one effect at a time. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. And these global effects weren't as common. Although to kind of balance that, I think if you got rid of one effect with another one, something generally bad... If you hadn't dealt with the with the thing that yeah. needs to be dealt with, mm. and another thing came to replace it, the bad stuff on that first one happened. So you're always in a little bit of a race to make sure that you'd kind of yeah that mm. you dealt with it in the first place. Okay, that so, sounds kind so of there's cool. the ongoing kind of you know you can't let this thing break through, but there's also this other stuff that's kind of going on more locally that you need to take 
This sounds remarkably reminiscent to our ongoing game of Pandemic Legacy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of. There are there are similarities between mm. it. Yeah, uh, 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 very broad stroke similarities, but course, yeah. yeah, sure. Uh, especially with the movement as well, because you're kind of saying, right, if somebody goes to Sydney and deal with that gre- that shogoth that's just materialised, someone goes to Paris and close that portal, someone goes to the Antarctic because there's good stuff there, because there's a relic expedition, <laughs> you might be able to get a magical weapon. Mm. And then I've got, as I said, I've got all the expansions bar the last one, and there's two of them are big box ones which add extra board sections. So oh, one wow. of them adds um, the Antarctic expedition from Out the Mountains of Madness, which I don't think either of you two have read. One of the great Lovecraft novels which all this is based on. Okay. So it, it basically adds that area in so you can go to there and explore like six or seven more locations. Right. The one I haven't played I've got was Under the Pyramids, which adds the Nile and Cairo and adds locations there to do things. Wow. Thankfully, as ga- again, not as faffy as the expansions for Arkham Horror. Mm. Expensive for Arkham Horror had so many extra rules that basically one person had to sit by that board and manage it. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> because there'd be lots of different things that that board it's, had it to do. sounds very, very FFG. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, it's classic FFG. Mm. This is mm. classic fantasy flight games. Tokens, dice, takes up your entire table. Takes your entire weekend. Yeah, it yeah. takes yeah. at least four or five hours. Don't read the box. It's a lie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Half an hour per person. <laughs> Just how many players? How many people are playing this game? I would say actually. Are they in the cupboards? Arkham and both Arkham and Eldritch can play up to eight players. Wow. And I would tell you now, don't. No. We played six. <laughs> Look of terror on your face when you said that. We, we played it six once on Tuesday night, and we got three quarters of the way through in four hours oh good god four is the happy number for that game yeah I think so I think five pushes it a little bit over as well I think five would be alright if people had played it a few times mm. but yeah if you've got people who are fairly inexperienced at it and mm. spend most of the time going well, what else can I do <laughs> you've been going for half an hour <laughs> let it go mm. <laughs> I've given you a card that says what you can do mm. read it <laughs> so what are these rules again I don't understand it. <laughs> Get <laughs> out. That's so, yeah. so that was... Eldritch Horror. Eldritch Horror, yeah. yeah. Well done. It's Eldritch Horror, yes. Please, please get rid of that really big space. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think it's time to draw it to a close because I'm sure you're probably annoyed of hearing our horrible voices. If you'd like to see more reviews, of which Andy's been writing some particularly good reviews these last couple of weeks, actually putting me to shame. I've spent five years trying to hone my craft and Andy manages to nail it in one review. Ding! So, uh, there's a few... Curses, <laughs> Lewis. <laughs> I find my role in life. If you want to check out Andy's reviews, go check out www.polyhedroncollider.com. We're, of course, on Facebook, facebook.com slash Polyhedron Collider. We're on Twitter. I'm at Polyhedron C. I'm at Sonic H with a zero. <laughs> and I'm at John Cage. John's got the simplest one. He's just got his name. You can listen to this podcast on YouTube, on iTunes. Please go to iTunes and leave us a review or at least a rating. Even if it's a bad review, at least we'll get some reviews on there because at the moment we've got nothing. Nothing? No, nothing. Oh, that's mean. It is a bit. Sort yourself out, audience. Or does everyone just listen to us on YouTube because it's nicer? Or maybe they subscribe to the train of thought of if you can't say something good, say nothing at all. (laughs) In which case, remain silent. (laughs) We will be back in three to four weeks' time. I'm not going to guarantee when we're going to be back because every time I do, we never end up meeting that requirement. But... In a few weeks' time, we'll be back with even more gaming goodness. And tatty bye from me. Tatty bye from Andy. And bye from me. <laughs> Good night. Cascade, well that sounds good. Cascade holds all noise. It's nice that, Saltaire. I do like Saltaire. Oh, I do like Saltaire. Yeah. Scotland. Is it? Saltaire, it must be. It's the name means. of the Scottish flag. Well, that's Saltaire. <laughs> what? I thought it was Leeds. It probably is. Saltaire Brewery. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting um, confused with Saltaire, the Scottish St Andrew's Cross. Ah, uh, okay. You're probably right. It probably is Leeds or Stoke or something. 
West Yorkshire. They are. Shipley. 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 <laughs> just it's approaching work. Manchester, that is. Multi universe, it's all that less in Manchester. <laughs> right, then, boys, we're all mad for the uni- multi universe, and let's get on it. <laughs>